Well, thanks. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, a, a Q&A opportunity, the next best uh, option to, to raise questions, other than catching me in the hallway. Um, now, the birds of a feather sessions work like this. They're usually more like at the end of the conference. Here we have them after lunch. I find that a perfectly fine opportunity as well. So, um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have around uh, Spring Framework or any Spring-related projects, of course. Um, I'm particularly interested in feedback uh, around, around what we're doing in Spring 5 and uh, uh, Spring Data Reactive, uh, Spring Boot 2, that sort of stuff. Uh, but if uh, the discussion goes in any other direction, I'm perfectly happy as well, of course. So, uh, I, have the, I have the laptop set up just in case we want to illustrate something, so we can also, if there are any questions or uh, any code samples to discuss, I'm happy to uh, um, show them and uh, we can discuss them basically with a visual impression of uh, the code that we, we're talking about here. Uh, but fundamentally, it's a Q&A session, so um, it's uh, questions and answers. All right, any, any first takers? Any first questions? Um, otherwise, if, if, if I may uh, raise one, um, there's, now in, in, in Spring 5, we are, uh, we are pretty up to date with uh, a lot of the infrastructure that we are, that we are embracing. Um, when can you see yourselves upgrade to JDK 9? So let's assume it goes out in September. Um, who would be considering the upgrade this year still, like end of the year or so? Any, are there any really early upgraders? That's cool. Um, who would be upgrading next year, maybe, to, to JDK 9? Okay, well, there could be a few more hands, since uh, from my perspective, uh, we really should be um, considering the upgrades within a 12-month time frame after the uh, JDK goes out, really. At least considering it, doing smoke tests. Okay, let's do the same, uh, the same hand raising um, for a current Spring Framework application, that, uh, Spring application that you may have already. Who's considering an upgrade to Spring Framework 5 this year still, assuming that we go GA in July? Okay, who would be upgrading next year maybe? All right, that's not too bad. Um, we want you to upgrade, right? So I'm, I'm not just uh, uh, pitching the upgrade to JDK 9. Um, obviously, I mean, I do care about JDK 9. I really believe that the uh, we need to embrace the latest generation of the JDK whenever we can. Uh, but, but there's, of course, a self-interest. Uh, we also want you to upgrade to Spring Framework 5. Uh, you may imagine that there is a maintenance impact. Um, we, we are only really willing to maintain, at most, three branches of uh, Spring Framework. So um, uh, we are phasing out older generations, minor generations, rather, rather eagerly at this point. 4.3 is going to be supported for several years. Spring from 5.0 and then 5.1, then we are already at three branches again. Right, so by, by early next year, if you are upgrading to Spring 5, it, in all likelihood, you will already have Spring from 5.1 to upgrade to, by the way. So um, uh, that might not be a bad thing anyway. Already a first uh, refinement iteration. All right, um, who's got, uh, if I may iterate my, my themes, um, who already has HTTP2 enabled server systems? Uh, well, HTTP2 enabled Tomcats or uh, uh, Jetties or... Who's considering to enable HTTP2 on their service this year still? Who's, uh, any, anyone's got, um, waiting for major upgrades like JDK 9 or Tomcat 9, uh, I assume? Uh, that, that, that's a totally sensible strategy. So, uh, uh, based on my own recommendations from, from, from the session before, um, if you have a strategy where you're saying, okay, I know Tomcat 9 is going to go GA later this year, so a perfect window of opportunity for the upgrade for me is early next year, that's great. Most people aren't there. Most people do not have an upgrade plan um, for HTTP2 enablement for Server 4 or for JDK 9. It's always better to have a plan than none at all, right? Even if the plan um, drags out into, into next year. Um, all right, uh, well, while we're at it, configuration styles. Um, I, I suppose most of you, you know the annotation-based model, use the annotation-based model, um, so I'm not even going to pull. But um, who likes the 
programmatic functional registration style, who can, uh, like is the wrong word, sorry, uh, who can see themselves potentially using it, the functional configuration style? Nice. Oh, wow, that's more than I thought, uh, significantly more. Uh, that's great, because uh, we love it, <laughs> uh, for certain purposes, of course, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a solution for everything, and there's different trade-offs in everything, but we find it a perfectly nice companion option. Uh, almost a little bit, some of us uh, almost wonder why we didn't do it at an earlier point, but there is a reason why we're doing it now. Uh, it's Java, the Java 8 Foundation. Uh, just in case you're wondering. The reason why we're doing it now is because the framework itself is Java 8 based, can use Java 8 across the framework, can use Java 8 APIs in its signatures. So we can do things like, well, uh, register bean methods with the Java util function supplier. Supplier is a Java 8 based uh, function type. So we can only introduce such hard signatures uh, in core container APIs now where the framework is Java 8 based. Previously, we could reflectively support Java 8 constructs in your code. Now, like if you declared handler methods with Java util optional or completable future or um, any other Java 8 API types, local date time, we, ref we would reflectively detect them and support them at runtime. That's what Spring Framework 4.3 does. But we could not use them in our own code base and in our own hardcore container contracts. And we are able to do this now. And that's great, because uh, Java 8 brings, brings the Java Util function package, brings uh, the Java Util stream API. There's, there are really nice things we can do with this. Um, and not just internally, but also expose it to you. And the register bean with a supplier is a really nice uh, example for this. All right. Um, next up on the list is Kotlin. Anyone, has anyone tried? Any, has anyone spent time with Kotlin already? tried or read up tutorials? Okay, quite a few hands. Anyone using Kotlin already? Uh, anyone? That's what? Uh, uh, the question was in production. Well, in development. <laughs> uh, in more than an experiment. Um, but uh, anyone uh, seeing themselves using Kotlin, say, later this year or early next year, maybe? With a little bit of uh, time to settle still? All right. Um, I'm, I'm asking the Kotlin question in particular to very diverse audiences uh, recently, and the, um, it's quite interesting. Uh, Kotlin has a lot of traction. So if, if you may wonder, again, just a little bit of background, uh, if you may wonder why are we doing Kotlin now, um, you, you probably know that we had a Groovy story. We, we have dedicated Groovy support, Groovy DSL support for Bing configuration. We have some runtime Groovy support for runtime Groovy code, for Groovy proxying of Groovy classes and, and, and other special Groovy handling. In Spring Framework 4 in particular, Spring Framework 4 had a Groovy theme, a Java 8 theme and a Groovy theme. Uh, and Kotlin to us is, is, is basically now a, a, a candidate at Groovy level. It, it is, of course, newer, fresher. It's actually not that new. It's been in development for quite a few years. Uh, but it has a lot of potential. From my perspective, from our perspective, it has the same potential that Groovy has, maybe even more. Um, that's, of course, a, a bit of um, an assumption, right? Maybe, just maybe, Kotlin remains a niche. Uh, well, we have uh, quite a few early adopters. Uh, uh, the features that we have in Spring Framework 5 the extensions for generic application context, the extensions for JDBC template, and some other APIs uh, uh, where with specific Kotlin K-class and K-function support. Um, some of them we suggested, but some of them have been suggested from early adopters. When we started doing this, quite a few people came along and created tickets on the issue tracker saying, well, why not do it for JDBC template and REST template as well? And um, it would be really nice because it uh, saves me a few you know, in my signatures, it saves me from a Kotlin dot class, uh, uh, a class dot Java to a just a class if you have a K class overload. There are, um, there are simple measures that we can take to make the Kotlin experience more, more idiomatic, cleaner across the code base. And that's exactly what we're doing, right? It's, uh, it's first class in the sense of us uh, treating, treating Kotlin requests as a first class issue. If somebody says, like, you know, an overload here would really make my life easier and my Kotlin experience more idiomatic. We, we are very open to rolling it in at the next possible point. Uh, so even now, right? If, if, you, if you created an issue right now, we would consider it at least 4.5 to do RC3 still. 
and then for the 5.4x line. So it, it's an ongoing theme. Ma many things that we are starting in Spring Framework 5 are an ongoing theme. Uh, we, we are starting the process now with a reasonably complete picture, but there's, there are going to be refinements. There's going to be a 5.1, a 5.2, refinements to the reactive support, to the functional registration APIs, to the Kotlin support, uh, to JDK 9 support, of course. All right, oh, yeah, uh, so we got one more to pull. Um, the reactive web stack, right, Spring Web Flux, and I guess we're going to talk a little bit more about that anyway uh, afterwards. Uh, but uh, who can see themselves building reactive web stacks in the near future, like uh, this year, next year? All right, that's quite a bit of interest. Uh, anyone, uh, has anyone tried um, Vertex uh, or looked, looked at Vertex or Redpack or uh, other reactive web stacks out there? There are a few. The so-called, uh, I think they call themselves micro web frameworks sometimes. All right, um, because that's, that's basically where we're coming from. Um, the, um, uh, the WebFlux framework is not a successor to Spring Web MEC. It's a companion. It's a different way of building a web stack, motivated by the likes of uh, um, Aka Play, Vertex, Redpack, in that spirit, basically. But with a, a spring flavor, with a spring style, and shipped out of the box in Spring Framework 5. We did consider making it a separate project. You can imagine, you know, it's like a, uh, Im imagine uh, running an open source project. There's always, there's always the question, do I spin this off into a separate project? Is this part of my core project? Um, we, we went through several iterations, but then we did decide that it makes sense to roll this into Spring Framework 5 proper, because it needs equivalent support in Spring Data, it needs support in Spring Security, in Spring Integration, and eventually in Spring Boot 2. So it's, it's a very cross-cutting concern, right? Um, uh, it's, it's not a single isolated feature, a single isolated package. It really needs, in, in order for a reactive web stack to make sense, you need to build a stack that's reactive from the bottom to the top, right? From the data store, the data store driver, to the uh, uh, reactive uh, uh, engine that you're using, up to the HTTP connectors. Everything needs to be reactive. Then it makes most sense, right? Uh, there may be a middle ground, but frankly, um, personally, I believe that uh, it, it is a very bottom-up driven affair. If you have a reactive data store driver, if you know that you can use Redis, Couchbase, Mongo, Cassandra, um, data store systems with a reactive driver, um, that may motivate you to expose the power of that data store, the power of the driver, to the web stack. So one motivation why we're building WebFlux is to let you expose that power if you, if, if you have it underneath at the data store level and not to waste it kind of uh, in a, in a server-based environment. But it also works the other way around. If you have blocking data store APIs, JPA, JDBC, basically all the traditional uh, relational database interactions, that may be a strong reason why you're better off with the servlet stack, why the reactive stack is not an immediate option for you. It can be. There are ways of combining this. You can set up a worker thread pool. Uh, it's a rather complex architectural topic um, to make a combination work. Uh, what we are looking for in the spring world is natural outcomes, natural combinations of things, right? So, and the most natural combination is a reactive data store driver with a reactive web stack and a traditional JPA, JDBC, relational database-based system with a servlet stack. Those are really the natural combinations. I'm, I'm slightly simplifying it here, um, but that's, the, that's essentially uh, the advice at this point from, from our side. Um, right, uh, well, uh, let, let, let's follow up on that. Um, has anyone a concrete scenario in mind where they could be using WebFlux? Any, any questions for maybe in a, in a specific scenario of whether WebFlux could be a candidate for you there? Sure. Yes, um, someone has a microphone. I, I barely see you, just in... Oh, the lights, right? Uh, hi. So uh, there was a talk yesterday about uh, the next version of uh, JAX RS, mm -hmm. and uh, they will not be supporting uh, non-blocking AI. 
Is yep. that supported in uh, Webflux? Yep, Webflux is built from the ground up uh, based on non-blocking I.O. Um, reactive streams do not make sense um, with blocking I.O. So uh, uh, the, the, the entire foundation, uh, the HTTP uh, engine, the uh, engine abstraction that we're supporting and the uh, streams modeling at runtime is non-blocking. That has a lot of impact. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, the way we are building this right now is not based on the Java Util concurrent flow type, in case you're wondering. The, uh, so maybe, maybe let's clarify that quickly. Java Util concurrent flow is the reactive streams interfaces repackaged. The original reactive streams interfaces live in org.reactivestreams. You can find them on Maven or on the reactivestreams.org website. It's an industry collaboration outside of the Java community process. A collaboration between RxJava, between a Lightband with Akka, uh, between um, a Pivotal with uh, Project Reactor, and other stakeholders in the industry. A kind of follow-up to the Reactive Manifesto. So for us, the canonical version, the original version, the reference version, of the Reactive Streams interfaces are the org Reactive Streams interfaces, and that's what we are using. So the Spring 5 Webflux stack is built on the org Reactive Streams interfaces, on RxJava 2, on Reactor, if you choose to, if you choose to use them. Um, both of them are also based on org.reactivestreams. Uh, the JDK9 repackaging at this point is a bit of an exercise. I'm not aware of anyone using these or wanting to use these, uh, since it basically means it only works in JDK9. Um, the JDK9 repackaging opens up some potential for those interfaces to appear in, in other Java interfaces, like in JaxRS. But we are not constrained by this. We can use any open source interfaces. Uh, so we choose to use the org reactive streams version. Um, org reactive streams has a central artifact called the publisher, which I, I mentioned before. And the same appears in Java Util concurrent flow. It's a nested type called flow.publisher. That's the, the, that's the essential element. Whatever you're building in a, a reactive composition pipeline essentially is a reactive streams publisher. A simple one, a complex one, but it is a Reactive Streams publisher that you pass to the network stack, and the network stack then says, okay, I have a response publisher now, and uh, once I connect my response stream, uh, I register the subscriber with it, and then we start pumping data back to the client. Um, the way we are supporting this is that we are looking at your signatures. So if you use a, a, an annotated request mapping method, you can return basically any Reactive Streams publisher to us. A Reactor Mono, a Reactor Flux, they are both Reactive Streams publishers. And they are what we are typically showing in our examples because we internally use Reactor as well and we, uh, we find Reactor a very tight and streamlined Reactive Composition Library uh, in Flux and Mono. But you could also return a Reactive, uh, an RxJava2 flowable, which also is an implementation of Org Reactive Streams publisher. So we naturally detect and adapt that. If you return a uh, Java Util concurrent flow publisher to us, we are also going to detect that reflectively. So when we, I don't have an example for you because there is no Java Util concurrent flow publisher implementation out there as far as I know. Uh, but if you happen to find something that implements the JDK9 flow publisher type, you can return it to the Webflux stack. We detect it as a publisher, adapt it to the Org Reactive Streams publisher interface, which is the same anyway, just in a different package location and process it from there. So in that sense, we are forward compatible with potential uh, GDK9 publisher implementations that may be coming. That's our strategy there. But uh, in, in JAXRS, I understand their decision. Uh, they can't reference uh, non-Java star packages. So they, they can't use org reactive streams. They can't even have ArxJava, ArxJava support in the spec, only in Jersey. Um, and they do a fine job at that. I mean, the, the, the client-side user of, uh, of reactive interaction is nice. We have a, a, a similar reactive web client API in Spring 5, uh, by the way. So we don't just have... The web, Webflux framework is basically like Spring WebMVC. It's a server-focused framework. But we have a uh, reactive web client, a kind of fluent reactive alternative to REST template. We have that uh, as of recently. And that's similar to what JaxRS ha has, just uh, reactive streams based out of the box and um, not finding a middle ground with completable future. Uh, completable future is sort of half reactive, right? Sort of smart async, but not really reactive, not back pressure driven, uh, and, and somewhat limited in its composition and in its, in its expression power. We find it quite important that uh, 
reactive types uh, have a, a, a granularity, and complete will future is just one thing, and it may time out, right? But nothing in between. Whereas uh, in RxJava and then Reactor, you have more specific modeling of cases, like an, an open-ended stream or a single element or a no element. Uh, you can model that very explicitly, both in Reactor and in RxJava, and we find that quite quite important. So um, uh, that shines through in our web client API as well. But the, the more important part is the server-side story. Uh, and I'm not aware of any intentions in JAXRS or Jersey to model the server-side uh, server story at this point. They, uh, they primarily looked at client-side interactions. That's an important part of the puzzle, uh, whereas our focus is really on non-blocking interaction uh, with the network stack on the server-side. We're, we're taking that to, to, to a, 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 the, the maximum level possible on the JVM. Um, it's primarily a question of how you would use it, right? Uh, but un underneath the covers, there's all, it, there may be Tomcat, there may be Netty, but uh, there's no traditional uh, server container anymore. That's, that's unavoidable. And I'm not quite sure what JaxRS uh, would be doing in future generations, but uh, I, I'm not aware of any plans there. Sure. Regarding, uh, regarding the Spring data, you mentioned in the morning session that um, uh, Spring Data Redis probably mm -hmm. will have some reactive support in 5.0. Uh, uh, in Spring Data K, which is, it's not in Spring Framework 5, but in, a, in an associated Spring Data yeah, release, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, do you plan to release all, uh, support for the rest of the, um, uh, let's say, Spring Data family, like, uh, let's say, Spring Cassandra, uh, Spring Data Cassandra, or uh, Spring Data Dynamo, uh, yep. probably Dynamo is not uh, supported by Spring, by, but by the community, but yep. anyway, yeah. There are discussions. Uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a proper outcome for you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but uh, we, we, they, it's a, our Spring Data team, they did implement it for, for uh, Redis uh, uh, and, and, and Mongo prim primarily. Uh, there's also a reactive couch-based driver. There are a couple of interesting things. There's a reactive um, Postgres driver, non-JDBC-based. Cool. Uh, there are a few things they are considering, and Cassandra has just been recently discussed whether we should promote it to, a, to an official uh, uh, status. Um, this will f happen in some form. The question is just when, uh, I, I would argue. And uh, reactive support can also happen in community modules, right? This, it's not necessarily something that we only do to Spring Data proper. Um, <coughs> it may just take another iteration. Uh, Spring Data has a release train model, so currently it's this K release train uh, that goes uh, final shortly after Spring Framework 5.0. Uh, that doesn't mean it's the end of the road. So if, if a case can be made, if there are a few people interested, a few stakeholders for Cassandra, um, now is the time to voice it, right? Uh, we need to know how much interest there is, and that influences the decision, for sure. Uh, also, uh, do you plan to somehow leverage the community in uh, a way that... Uh, it implements more such reactive support in their modules in form of uh, vanilla apps or examples or... Yeah. <coughs> uh -huh. Well, we can, uh, we, we can lay the groundwork. We can, we can start with guidelines and recommendations of our own and with sample apps of our own. Um, whether we can so easily motivate uh, other stakeholders to participate, is it, it, it's up to them, right? Uh, I, I expect that to naturally happen. Uh, I've already seen a few initiatives, a few articles, a few blog posts around it, uh, but we are waiting for that. We are, we are curious ourselves, right? So we, uh, we, we don't know how popular certain options are, um, and uh, we're really waiting for the community to make up its mind. Um, and, and all of us are the community, right? So uh, we can influence it a little bit, but so can you. Um, so in, in, in that sense, um, by the end of the year, we'll be wiser. There's already going to be a bit of, uh, a bit of adoption uh, in, in, in the sense of documentation, tutorials, sample apps, for sure. Um, I know a few, a few initiatives out there, uh, but they largely come from, from our immediate vicinity. Uh, for example, the uh, Mix IT conference website in, in France, in Lyon, uh, is a uh, Spring Boot 2 or Webflux-based uh, uh, application, including the call for papers and the, the schedule builder. Um, so there, there, there are a few of those out there. Um, 
and, and they are published on GitHub, so they, you can use them as a reference application looking at the source code, which is quite nice. I can see more of that happening. Some early adoption in certain, maybe not entirely critical corners of the industry, and, and the, 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 the complete source code, including the build published on GitHub, that, that's nice, right? Uh, we are looking for complete use cases. So isolated little sample snippets are an illustration. That's a good start. Uh, but you can only really grasp the full impact and power and also the downsides of it by, by trying to implement a real use case. So I really appreciate that something's happening out there already. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting more of that. Last question. Um, about the Java modularity, um, you mentioned that uh, in 6.0 release of Spring, you ah. will introduce the manifests and the metadata within yeah. the JAWS. Um, so the slide said, yeah. Should, should I be concerned about, uh, um, uh, some, uh, for example, um, it, will, it will be possible that some of the implementation will become private or hidden. Mm. Uh, should I be concerned ah. uh, in terms of uh, having some references in my code uh, yep. uh, to such? implementations? Great, great points, great points. Um, so basically, are we going to make use of, um, of the power of module descriptors to hide internal, certain internal packages? Uh, and, and which would be candidates? Um, if, if I'm taking the question as such. So um, we haven't made a, an ultimate decision yet, but the mom we, we did spend a little bit of time looking at the uh, exposure of, um, of, uh, of our public surface. It's surprisingly hard to consider anything internal there, since uh, for almost every uh, public artifact, there's some external consumption, not necessarily in applications, mostly in third-party extensions, for almost everything. We have a really hard time finding like an entire package, and we can, uh, we can only conceal entire packages, right, in, uh, in, in Jigsaw. You can decide not to export certain sub-packages. Uh, we have yet to find an entire sub-package where there's no external uh, user. So based on our, our and my current understanding, we do not plan to hide anything. So even with module descriptors, it is very, very likely that we're going to export the entire public surface. Everything that's a public type is still accessible afterwards. So in that sense, you don't have to have a concern. Uh, because anything, even as obscure as it may be that you're using, you, you're probably not the only one, and uh, it will still be exported. Uh, that could theoretically change through some refactorings. Um, maybe, just maybe, we would introduce some new packages in Spring Framework 6 that are not exported f right from the start, but, but then there's no backwards compatibility problem because they, they've never been exported, right? Um, so let's see, right? But I, I don't think that that's going to be an issue. Um, at least not, certainly not the biggest issue. Uh, there may be other refactorings in Spring Framework 6, other API redesign that may have a bigger impact. It's not going to be that we are hiding so many uh, packages. And it, that's also the reason why we, we are not in a hurry. Um, the Jigsaw module descriptors give us the power to export certain packages and not export others, but at the moment we don't see uh, a need for that power. And the default conventions, for jars on the module path that do not ship a module descriptor like we do now, the default conventions are to export everything, to implicitly see all the other modules on the module path so we can access Jackson and Hibernate, we can register converters for Joda time just by their mere presence on the module path. That's great. It's almost perfect. We don't have to know their module names. So uh, we are avoiding a lot of problems and getting almost all of what we want to accomplish by not shipping module descriptors. I know it sounds a little odd, um, but for us, the uh, ability to design jar files for use as automatic modules on the module path without module descriptors is one of the greatest features in JDK 9. It, all, it has almost perfect semantics for us. This implicit visibility that we see all the other modules, you know, Spring Boot auto configuration, even at Spring Framework level, auto configuration of checks and converters and whatever else, the show the time converters. This is all implemented based on detecting the presence of that other library, automatically registering a converter for that other library. We have to see the other modules, a lot of optional visibility that we want there. And automatic modules in JDK 9 have exactly that semantic. 
Um, we transitively see our own uh, uh, dependencies. So if you require Spring Context, Spring .context in your modules, uh, you implicitly allow us to see uh, Spring.core and your module transitively to see Spring.core and Spring.bean sets. It's quite nice. Uh, it's really not much to complain about as far as we know at this point, right? I mean, obviously problems may materialize later, but uh, uh, it's quite okay. So uh, uh, we, we are regularly testing this and the experience is actually all right. Uh, you could argue that uh, the benefits are not enormous, you know, in a, in a well-designed spring-based application, conceptually modularized, maybe with uh, um, IDE level modules, you know, Eclipse or IntelliJ modules. Uh, you're producing sep uh, several char files already, nicely isolated. Maybe you're using some uh, validation tools uh, for the dependencies between your modules or uh, um, IntelliJ's uh, uh, package analysis and dependency analysis. Um, th there are lots of features in the IDEs and in our build tools already. Personally, I find the biggest value there in the source code decomposition of an application into modules. Not necessarily in runtime enforcement. Runtime enforcement is kind of a bonus. Uh, what's, what really matters is, is that we're designing our, our, our application code bases in a, in a, in a structured, well-justified, well hopefully modularized manner, right? But as to the best possible degree. That's what we're working with every day. We're sitting in front of the IDE and working with the, the, the module structures there. Do we really care that much whether our runtime system enforces module boundaries in the end. If we did everything right, there are not many boundaries to enforce any, anyway, right? So it's sort of a, it's a bit of a bonus step. I'm not trying to de-emphasize the importance of Jigsaw. It's nice to translate a project level module structure to a runtime representation. There's some nice benefits from this, uh, an optimization potential for localized caches per module for classes and resources found in each module. But in a, in a well-designed layout right now on the class path, you get most of this already. So the, I'm not sure it's a killer feature, a killer argument, right? Uh, if you're already nicely modularized at the project level, runtime, runtime modularization is a nice to have, not a must have. Um, anyway, right, so that's, uh, I have a, a sort of balanced, um, opinion on this. I spent quite a bit of time with OSGI in about 10 years ago and uh, with uh, uh, source code setups and uh, source code modularization approaches uh, uh, around the same time. So I, I have seen quite a bit of this uh, in the past 10, 12 years in the industry. Uh, and um, yeah, this, I'm, I'm not sure that, that that balance changes now. So in that sense, Jigsaw is nice. It provides some nice validation. It, it catches stuff that you maybe should have caught in your project setup or in your build process already, but better catching it on startup than never, right? So uh, in that sense, it's, uh, it provides nice benefits there. Maybe some, some runtime efficiency in lookups. Um, some self-descriptiveness of the jar files, that may also be a benefit, right? You, you, can, you, you can open up a jar file or maybe there are even some tools like Maven Central automatically parsing uh, or giving jigsaw module indications, parsing module descriptors if there are any so that you can look at uh, the Maven Central page for your artifact and you see the exported packages or the, the concealed packages. So um, formalized module descriptors in the char files uh, can have site benefits, documentation benefits, validation benefits, tooling benefits. Uh, but they are all, they are all on the, on, on the subtle, subtle end, on the nuanced end of the spectrum. So that's why I'm saying there may not be a single killer reason why you're using Jigsaw. There may be many soft reasons why you're using it. Right. Sure. The first question is about the non-blocking implementation and deadline, um, uh, the web flow. Uh, it, it web is flow? React, uh, yeah, it is oh, uh, native web implementation. Flux, yeah. 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 Uh, it is native. Uh, it can be native. Yeah. So, um, what are uh, other choices? Uh, the, uh, so there, there, there was this, uh, while I have it here, right? um, that's actually the reason why I, I uh, set up the styles. Uh, so maybe let's spend a, um, a minute or two on this. Um, so, the, um, uh, it's a kind, of, kind of interesting arrangement. We have an HTTP um, engine abstraction underneath. It's modeled after Netty because Netty is, of course, a key target, right? I mean, essentially, everybody uses Netty. Uh, Redpack uses Netty. Uh, look at all the other reactive web stacks out there. They are all Netty-based. 
and Netty for us is an important uh, 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 offering down there. We may even make it the default in Spring Boot 2. Um, we're not a little undecided between Tomcat and Netty at this point. Um, but at the same time, it's not the only option because Netty is a bit of a beast. It's a highly sophisticated, um, extremely powerful, extremely customizable networking library. Um, it's almost a little overwhelming to the uninitiated. So uh, um, there may be a benefit in choosing a slightly simpler HTTP engine that's also perfectly non-blocking in terms of its I.O. Uh, capabilities, uh, like Tomcat's HTTP cores. We are actively investing in Tomcat. So it's not like we're just taking Tomcat and trying to wrap it. Uh, there's an ongoing, um, more than a year already, an ongoing investment into Tomcat to prepare Tomcat for use as a reactive HTTP engine. Um, of course, if, you know, if nobody ever tested it and if nobody ever challenged it, uh, it's not going to work fine. And there were issues. Um, but now there's even a dedicated Tomcat committer that employed by Pivotal, actually. Um, uh, Pivotal employs three Tomcat committers in the meantime. Um, so one of them, Violetta, she's, um, she is tasked with uh, improving Tomcat's reactive capabilities or Tomcat's use in a reactive web stack. So Tomcat is actually pretty far along. Jetty sort of, they, they, they did this a few years ago, they focused on it, but nothing much happened recently. Uh, but both of them have um, uh, data buffer capabilities, so they, uh, an essential capability, basically non-blocking data buffers. Um, what we are doing in our adapters is that we're basically taking their engine and their data buffer abstraction, and we are uh, adapting them to our runtime stack. That works great for Tomcat and Jetty. It works great for Netty, of course. I mean, Netty is designed for that. Oh, it has to work with Netty, obviously. And with Undertow, uh, we're not using the Undertow server bridge. We're just using Undertow core. So Undertow is a pretty recent uh, uh, project, after all, a couple of years old, underneath Wildfly, and always had two layers. It always had a kernel, an HTTP kernel, and a server bridge, separate artifacts. And our, in our reactive web stack, you don't have to use the server bridge, just Undertow core. And Undertow core is pretty nice. Nice functional uh, API for configuring it, data buffer abstraction, everything we need. Right? So the, those are the four primary targets. Tomkit, Jetty, Netty, and Undertow. Uh, whether you, in that list, you could put Netty first as kind of the most powerful option. At the moment, Tomkit is first because in the current web starters, Tomkit is still the default. We may change our mind on that. Uh, but it's, it's a defaulting choice. It's not a particularly strong recommendation either. The second question sure. is about uh, the power of strings. Actually, uh, becomes if you um, can propagate it to the web layer, to the JavaScript uh, application, Angular uh, fork. Actually, now uh, using end-to-end -end interactive apes, uh, strings from the yep. database to the end-user interface. So uh, you may use, for example, JSON uh, JSON stream yep. uh, protocol. Yep. Um, um, how easy is it to, to uh, use it from the JavaScript side, for example, to uh, yeah. integrate with web clients? I mean, there's, there's kind of a, um, uh, a gap in between, right? That we, uh, we can only take this to the HTTP endpoint, and then somebody's trying to consume that endpoint in some other process, possibly on some other machine, right? In a streaming way, yeah. Yeah, in a streaming way. Um, but streaming is a great point in its own. Uh, so we do not do anything particular. Right? It's, it's sort of very decoupled from what the client does. The client may be a Java process and can, for example, use our uh, reactive web client. The client could also be a traditional REST template code, which is blocking on the client because the client may not care. Maybe it's a rich user interface with only a couple of threads, right? So a worker thread and you don't really care. Or, a regular, or just a simple, completable future-based uh, uh, arrangement may be good enough for a, a, a client, a user interface client, uh, but it's still non-blocking on the server, right? So uh, what, what the value that we are, we are delivering with Webflux on the server is to um, improve the efficiency of the use of the service resources. That's the only thing we can guarantee there. At the same point, it's of course a very nice combination. If you have a reactive web client and a reactive web server architecture, you have the most efficient use of resources on both ends. And yeah, that's of course, I mean, in that sense, absol you absolutely have a point. And in a, in a larger microservices architecture, there is a strong trend that if you start using reactive interaction somewhere, your higher level composed service facades 
will also be reactively coded because they reach out to target services, maybe compose some of the outcomes into the ultimate response going back to the client. There's a natural um, strong trend towards uh, a kind of reactiveness going throughout the entire system. Not necessarily, uh, but you will certainly consider um, consistent reactive interactions at, in, in any process in the, uh, in, in, in the chain. For JavaScript clients, um, we have a few dedicated things. I mean, you're totally free to do whatever the HTTP protocol allows you to do. Uh, but there is uh, first-class support for server sent events, and I've recently seen a stronger interest again in a server sent event model. Um, you can, of course, there's always the WebSocket option, but yeah. that's not... We actually have a WebSocket option on web plugs. We have the traditional Spring WebSocket stack uh, as server container extensions. Uh, you can do WebSockets on the WebPlug stack as well. Uh, we, that's in particular meant for standard HTTP endpoints, reactive on WebPlugs, and a, a couple of WebSockets. Does it propagate the back pressure to the client? <laughs> it can't. Um, there's no way to, to communicate this. Um, so it, 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 it's, a great, it's a great point. It would, there's, there's just no way to express that beyond the transport protocol. There are, of course, the measures that the, the network stack uh, provides us with. Right? So a, a client may, may get indications about stale TCP connections, or, uh, but we can't express, um, we can't really ex express back pressure itself uh, at that level. So, um, I mean, if, if you have any ideas or any, if there are any industry efforts uh, to optimize the interaction between the server and the client, where the server can give indications or estimations to the client when the next uh, 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 packets of data would, would be arriving so that the client can stop polling if it does poll, right? Um, we, we're, we're totally willing to support this, but I'm not aware of any. So um, it, 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 there is a network um, boundary in between, right? So we, we really have to um, agree with uh, some of the clients about uh, certain packets in service at events, uh, certain event types in service at events, or maybe HTTP headers, uh, I don't know, right? Uh, I, I'm not aware of any efforts in that space. But if you have ideas... Well, I, I think it's possible yeah. to propagate the back pressure to the WebSocket. But uh, okay. on, on WebSockets, yeah. WebSockets is a different manner, but w even WebSockets are sort of a little bit abstract um, in terms of what we can express, right? So, um, but. We are not at the end of the line for sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's potential for, uh, for a closer uh, alignment between uh, longer running uh, interactions uh, between a client and the server for sure. But, but there's nothing specific yet. Uh, and and we, are, we don't have immediate plans because we're not aware of what they would look like. Uh, but still, if you don't want to use WebSocket and server sent events, you, uh, is it possible to consume JSON stream, um, for example? In principle, absolutely. You can do anything and the HTTP channel lets you do, right? Even, even our service and event support is just a little bit of convenience. Um, so in, in, in the end, you say uh, text event stream as the, as, the, as, as the content type, and you return a flux of elements from, from a reactive endpoint, and we basically just do the obvious, right? If there's an open channel the, and, and the flux, the, the stream has a new element, we, we, we keep uh, publishing it. Uh, you can do the same with any other content type, with custom content types, with, uh, um, uh, with any payload structures, right? So they, it, it's not a hard-coded mechanism. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very natural interaction with the HTTP connection. But there are some demos, uh, for example, consuming from JavaScript uh, JSON stream or some yeah. other stream. Yeah, I, I, I haven't tried JSON streams, uh, but I'm pretty sure it would work. I'm not aware of where the limitation would be. So I'm pretty sure it's actually more natural in the WebFlux stack than in the WebMVC stack. If you do server sent events in WebMVC, you have to kind of uh, do a little bit of a dance, you know, or the, the deferred result model with a separate thread, then, then setting it complete. And it's, it's, yeah. it's actually more natural to express yourself for such long running uh, ev event driven connections. Uh, it's, more, it's more straightforward, more natural to express yourself in the, in the WebFlux model, yeah. for sure. Okay, thank you. But if you have anything more specific, raise it with us, please. Uh, we are super interested in use cases. Okay, so you showed us the annotation-driven configuration, also the more uh, programmatic one with the with the lambdas for the yeah, for the producer. Mm -hmm. So uh, when do you plan to get rid of the XML configuration in? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
uh, well, XML configuration is rarely to be found in the web layer at this point, right? Um, so the uh, web-based form control, uh, XML-defined form controller beans are a thing of the past largely at this point. Um, we still have XML bean configuration. Uh, we still have the XML namespaces. They're actually a very thin layer. If you look at the implementation, it's uh, compared to the entire framework code base, it's a very isolated, thin adaptation layer, almost just a parsing layer. Um, so we have no strong desires on our own to get rid of it because it's not a technical complexity. We, we did clean it up and streamline it a bit. There are, no, there are no version schemas anymore for the namespaces. You always resolve against the latest. There's no bean ref context XML model anymore. We got rid of some of the more esoteric features, right? But the basic XML bean definition model, I don't really see it going away. Um, largely because of a lot of existing code working with it, um, and at least for parts of its configuration still using it, can be nicely combined with both the functional and, and the annotation-based style. Let's not forget that the Groovy-based DSL uses the same namespace handler mechanism, so any Grails application out there kind of uses the XML bean definition model underneath. I mean, the Groovy DSL is structurally analogous to the XML DSL, and uses the same mapping infrastructure and literally the same namespace handlers, the same XST definitions for the namespaces even. So our, our XML bean definition model has wider applicability than uh, you may initially think. I mean, we're going to reach a point where there's probably more using Grails than in, 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 in classic Spring applications, right? Where, where, where the Grails factor with the Groovy DSL becomes a stronger reason to keep it than raw use of XML bean definitions. But in any way, the short version is, we are not going to get rid of it, we can't at this point, but I don't think that it, it actually gets in the way. In particular, for the web layer options, everybody's using the annotation-based model at this point, so I only really see two. Um, that you, you certainly have a, a, a strong motivation to um, be somewhat consistent in your choice of styles, right? If you build an annotation-based system, you're probably going to do it all the way through, from the uh, lower level layers up to the web layer. If you are going functional, I guess the same applies, right? You're going functional all the way through. Maybe you're going to combine it with a little bit of annotation-based configuration in a few places. That's totally okay. It's kind of, it's a decision that we leave up to you. Um, but we, we are, I mean, ourselves, we are trying to make our life easier. So we do get rid of things that are pain points for us. The remaining XML bean definition support simply isn't a, a huge pain point. It's not really a pain point at all. Uh, we have other pain points that we're probably going to get uh, rid of first. We, we did get rid of a lot in Spring 5. No, no port that support, no bean ref context model, no EGP implementation model. Um, so we are using Spring 5 as a cleanup opportunity, uh, but uh, primarily driven by our, our pain points. And uh, yeah, yeah ho hopefully we only touch stuff that you don't even notice, right? We largely cleaned up in corners of the framework that you probably never touched. Um, and the, the, the functional model, um, you may imagine there's actually a Kotlin extension for this, so I don't have it on, on, on the slides, but uh, the, your choice of language, of course, will naturally influence your choice of configuration style. So if you choose to use Kotlin, Kotlin works nice with uh, uh, any configuration style, really, uh, but it is particularly nice and particularly idiomatic if you use it with our functional registration mechanisms, both at the bean level and at the endpoint level. So um, even if we don't have it on the slides here, but imagine a uh, Kotlin-based variant of this sort of DSL. It's, it's even nicer than what we have here. Uh, if you want to see it in action, the, the Mixit application from that conference website in France that I mentioned is actually implemented with Kotlin on Webflux on Spring Boot 2 on Spring 5, 5 C1. So uh, you can see Kotlin in action there all the way through. At the same uh, uh, time, personally, I don't believe that the functional registration style is now going to take over the world in the next six months, right? Um, it's an option that we're offering. Um, it certainly is nice for certain scenarios, in particular in microservice architectures, maybe in test setups, anything more, more focused, more, uh, more tightly arranged. Uh, at the same time, it comes at a certain price. There are some things we cannot do, right? The, um, like even if we use, uh, uh, use this style here, this is a flexible signature, as in Spring MVC. You want another path variable, add the path variable. You want a request header, a cookie, add another argument to your method declaration. We reflectively see it and resolve it for you. you. You want a different return type, 
return something different, return an RxJava observable. We are going to adapt it for you. You don't have to do it, right? Whereas the functional model is a programmatic arrangement with hard interface contracts. It doesn't work any other way, right? Both in Java 8 and in Kotlin, there has to be a clear functional interface arrangement behind it. So that means hard interface signatures, which, you know, if you're used to the annotation-based model, this is like a little inconvenient. If you want the path variable there, you have to, you have to ask a given object, like a server request, to resolve the path variable for you, build a composition chain, and kind of take it from there. Right? It's not quite as convenient as saying add path variable on a long argument. So there's a bit of a trade-off involved, and this trade-off is not going away. The annotation-based model has certain strong benefits that we're going to keep up, and I believe it's going to remain very popular, and, and also for the reactive option, because of the, this nice, concise flexibility. You know, there's no noise here. It's a very focused source code. This is also nice, programmatic, straightforward source code, but there can be a little more noise. I mean, you could argue that there's less noise here, but it's still, it's still different, uh, a different coding style that you need to adapt yourself to first. Uh, it's not to everybody's taste. Uh, it's harder to debug, uh, for sure. Right? Well, arguably. There's, uh, it, it comes at a certain cost. Whatever we do in programming always comes with a trade-off. There is no single win-win-win, everything, everything best uh, option. Right? And uh, we just make a, a choice of first-class options for you, a limited number of options for you, and we present the trade-offs to you, and uh, the choice is yours. All right, uh, we are at the end. Any, any last question? Uh, sure. Can, can you talk about the uh, stage that you made built on uh, Kotlin and uh, Hill? Uh, where we can find the source oh, code of the... Uh, the, the application that, that, that you... Mixit website, if you, uh, yes. is that what you mean? Uh, just Google for Mixit Conf GitHub, you're going to find it. Mixit Conf? Uh, uh, Mixit, M-I-X-I-T. Okay. And then Conf, okay. I think it's called Mixit Conf uh, project on GitHub. Okay. You're, you're going to find it. Uh, uh, the, the maintainer of that uh, website, the, the author of that website is in my team, so I, uh, I can also ask him to uh, actually showcase it. Maybe, maybe we should do a blog entry about this, actually, on the Spring I.O. blog, uh, pointing out uh, uh, the Mixit website. We haven't done so yet. OK, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. All right. Any last minute question? And that's the last, sorry. Uh, so hi. I have a question about uh, Spring Cloud streaming. Basically, we did not mm -hmm. mention it in the board lectures. Uh, actually, the, I think the idea is that uh, it's going to be a reactive, uh, actually project reactive support uh, in in the court. I mean, yeah, I, um, I'm not intimately familiar with it since I'm just an advisor for Spring Cloud. Um, so that's a separate team that's managing those. But as far as I'm aware, your assumption is correct. Uh, they are uh, the the Spring Cloud guys are some of our strongest stakeholders for the reactive support. Yeah, uh, actually, the, this area, area is uh, actually pretty interesting for our team. Uh, basically, the communication between uh, between services and uh, the idea again is uh, for the back pressure. Currently, yeah. Spring Cloud streaming is a push method. So, yeah, in, tip it's, it's in typical Spring Cloud architectures, you're probably going to find yourselves benefiting from uh, uh, back pressure driven interaction very quickly. Yeah, I'm, I believe that's a great field of using it of applying. Um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, currently they are not uh, reactive native client. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'd have to check to the status myself, but if you're interested in reactive support and Darren, raise it with them. You know, they, we, are, we are always, we, we, are, we are lazy people, right? So sort of we are only reacting uh, <laughs> if, if, if somebody shows interest. Uh, uh, posit more positively worded, we are very stakeholder driven, right? So for, we are really investing our energy only in things that really matter in practice because somebody shows an interest. So let's give rounds of applause for you again. Uh, okay, thanks for, for the question. Thanks for the discussion.